June 1st, 2013, the start of Museum Weekend in and around Clinton County, New York. Calvin Castine on the streets of Lion Mountain in beautiful downtown Lion Mountain, New York, in front of the Lion Mountain Railroad and, or actually Mining and Railroad Museum. Not, I was thinking the other way, Railroad and Mining Museum, but I look over at the sign and it says Mining and Railroad Museum. We we're trying to decide which uh, one of our museums we would grace on this uh, opening day of Museum Weekend in the North Country and our friend Bill Chase gave us a call and said won't you come down here and we thought we'd take him up on that opportunity so we're gonna step inside and hear a guest speaker as they open their 2013 exhibit regarding sports in Lion Mountain. We are inside, we're about to hear a guest speaker and we're going to be very quickly here because the guest speaker is going to start in uh, in two minutes. You're not the guest speaker, are you? No, I'm not the guest speaker. I'm Wendell Denny. And Wendell, you uh, helped uh, take us around here last, uh, last fall. Yes. You did a nice job. Who are we going to listen to today? Uh, we have uh, Ken Davies and Alan. Uh, Alan and uh, Ken are both going to be doing a program on a D and H on a rail area. It's going to be a give and take situation where People can ask questions, listen to the information, and perhaps uh, some feedback from everyone who is here. Maybe somebody has some questions about the railroad or why it's here. You might also find that there's some people here who have some information about the railroad that we didn't know about. That's right. That we'd like to be able to kind of capitalize on, add to our collection. We're here in the, the railroad uh, section anyways, and lots of pictures, history, a lot of history here. Uh, we're going to start in about one minute yeah uh, this is the one section that we haven't gone through yet so we want to do it quick this year but last year we were here the last day that yes. it was open and that doesn't give people the chance to watch it and say I want to get down there so this year we want to uh, uh, get in here I'll get Gordy Little we'll come down and we'll do this room then we'll go out there and do it's more than just baseball though, the sports oh we have sports for winter sports summer sports all kinds of sports everything was here we have the irons uh, bobstat is here it was produced here by the uh, miners and raced in Lake Placid and other places in Europe we also have baseball there's some soccer pictures in there I think you'll find some uh, hunting and fishing trapping okay. uh, which were winter things that you could do. There's canoeing. There's a, a nice boat in there. And you see it kind of standing on end. You don't see many boats standing on end. <laughs> but we you needed to this. It in here. You we, it in here. we had to have the space, so we <laughs> put it kind of vertical. And you can see the interior, how nicely it's re been redone. It's really, really a nice boat. And you'll also see some uh, pictures of some of the hunting camps that were in the area back 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and some of the, the ones that are still existing. Uh, you'll find all kinds of uh, Memorabilia, there's some baseballs in there from some of the pitchers who pitched. Uh, some of the Yankee people uh, who were members of the Yankee team years ago. Uh, lots of things. Stop by and take a look. Okay, well, I will get a hold of you, and uh, maybe sometime in June uh, we can have some folks and come back here and do it yep. upright. In the meantime, we'll listen today, and the topic is going to be railroads. Yes. All right. Okay. Thanks, Wendell. All right. We're going to stick around here, and uh, guest speakers will be coming up here momentarily. Speak with these two gentlemen, and I hope that <clears throat> everyone who uh, came prepared with a lot of questions, or maybe has some answers for us, or some things that are solved for us. <clears throat> I'm not sure of everything that have transpired here with the D and H, but we do quite a bit. We have in our D and H collection here a lot of trains, a lot of pictures of things that actually took place here. And we have with us today uh, two gentlemen who are going to work and talk with us on the Shanghai Railroad, Delaware Hudson. Ken Davies and Alan Davies. And I'll turn it over to them. If you have any questions, anytime, don't hesitate. Stop and ask them. They'll be happy to. Yes, I see you really sneaked out of you in the introduction. What's that? I see you really sneaked out of you in the introduction. She always does that. <laughs> I'd, like to, I'd just like to start to say that I, uh, in preparation for this, I did quite a bit of research and I just wanted to, the handouts are. Uh, <coughs> The product of that research, and I just want to go through a little bit about how how I did some of this. The, I used the internet for most of it, and I used a number of search terms: Delaware, DNH, Delaware and Hudson, Delaware and Hudson Railroad, Delaware and Hudson Canal, and Chattagay Railroad. That will give you the, the, a 
large list of things that you can go through on the internet <laughs> using the search engines that are the search engines I use were Dogpile, Google, Bing, Yahoo, and Ask. And again, the, the list of websites that contain information about these things is considerable. The best of the websites were the uh, Wikipedia DNH entries, both for the railroad and the canal. The canal especially has good history on that, the beginnings of the Delaware and Hudson Company. Uh, the Bridge Line, again, the, the rest of the major websites were the Bridge Line Historical Society, the Delaware and Hudson Virtual Museum, <coughs> American Rails, Railroad Picture Archives, the National Park Service, which mostly had information on the canal, the history of the Chicago Ore and Iron Company, and uh, Blood and Tow Enterprises. Some of the research materials that I used were the uh, Delaware and Hudson book by Jim Shaughnessy and the uh, Mountain Railroads of New York State, Volume 3, Where Did the Tracks Go in the Eastern Adirondacks by Dr. Michael Kudich. Uh, the maps in the handout for the, the route of the railroad from Chasey Lake to <coughs> Uh, Lake Placid and uh, the yard maps for, for Lime Mountain and Standish both came from his, his book and I did get permission from him to use those. From the coal fields to the Hudson, uh, the history of the Delaware and Hudson Canal, the, uh, you can see the rest of them, that's fine. <laughs> the, uh, I want to go through a little bit about or quickly go through a little bit about how the Delaware and Hudson Company started. Basically, basically, it started as a canal company. Originally, it was uh, the child of a couple of brothers from uh, <coughs> the Philadelphia area, the Wirtz brothers. They uh, found through trips to northeastern Pennsylvania for both hunting and just wilderness trips, they found anthracite coal around Carbondale, Pennsylvania, <coughs> and wanted to get into the business of uh, taking that coal and selling it. The Philadelphia area was already more or less saturated with its own coal supply, and they thought that New York City market was a good way to go. So they came up with the idea of a canal from Holmesdale, Pennsylvania to Roundout, which is just below Kingston in New York State on the Hudson River. <clears throat> and in order to uh, get the coal from Carbondale to Holmesdale, which is the terminus of the canal in Pennsylvania, they uh, had to put in a gravity railroad, which was a railroad without really engines that ran on rails. It uh, pulled stuff up the mountain on one side and it slowly let it down on the other side. The <coughs> canal was opened in 1828 from Holmesdale, Pennsylvania to again round up New York to Royal Kingston on the Hudson River. Also, the, the B&H had the first steam rail locomotive in the United States, the Sturbridge Lion. But it was too heavy to run on the rails, so they just scrapped it. They also had, at the same time, obtained three other locomotives, and they disappeared. They, in transit from Holmesdale, they were in transit to Holmesdale from uh, Roundup. Two of the engines never even made it to Roundup, and one of them disappeared on, on the canal trip from Roundup to Holmesdale. Did they have any suspicions? There's nothing. They just, they just disappeared. So if you're around that area, look around. I'll look. I might have one of the great things. Some of the great things. You know, it's good. Metal detector. <laughs> the, the, yeah, it's interesting. The thing about the, uh, the engines to me was
was that the, the three names were the America and the Delaware and the Hudson. Did they actually so, exist? Yeah, they did. Well, at least according to everything I could find, it did. Uh, the first coal cars from Carbondale, the first coal cars traveled from Carbondale to Homesdale in 1829, and then subsequently on the canal. The canal, uh, the canal originally was uh, four feet deep and 36 feet wide at the surface, and 20 feet deep at the bottom and it was to accommodate boats with 30 tons of cargo. Subsequently, in, in years following, it was increased up to a final depth of five and a half feet to accommodate 50 ton boats. They uh, also did start passenger service on the rail uh, west of Carbondale because they did uh, expanded the trackage from the original mine in Carbondale to other mines as they <coughs> went back towards Scranton. And, uh, and these are all uh, narrow gauge. Uh, no, this is all. I believe it was all standard gauge, gauge down there. Yeah. The the value of uh, railroad over canal became evident. Uh, post-1863, and the Delaware and Hudson Company petitioned and received railroad rights to New York State in 1867. From 1864 to 1900, the mainline rail trackage was expanded to service the Wilkesboro, Scranton, and Binghamton areas to Albany, Schenectady, and Troy. Uh, and north to the Canadian border at Rogers Point. The expansion was accomplished through construction, leases, and negotiation of traffic rights. The last, the reason I just shrugged it a little bit was because of this. One place that I read said that the last canal usage was in 1891, and subsequently I found something that said it was used up through 1898 for the last boats. But it was, uh, <clears throat> wow. the Gravity Railroad and can Canal were abandoned in 1899, and the canal was sold. Some of the canal right away was subsequently used by the uh, New York, Ontario, and Western Railroad in south, uh, southeastern New York. And in 1968, the Delaware and Hudson Canal was named the National Historic Landmark. There are a number of museums and parks associated with the Delaware and Hudson Canal down there. And some of them, in some areas, the canal would even still have water in it, but not too many. Most places have been filled. In 1899, the name was changed to the Delaware and Hudson Company to reflect the lack of a canal. Now, the railroad. In 1876, New York State decided that they needed a railroad from Plattsburgh to Dannemora in order to more adequately service the prison with supplies. And they decided at that time to put in a narrow gauge railroad for a couple of reasons. One was cost and the other was the grade coming from Plattsburgh to Dannemora. And the uh, ability on narrow gauge to make sharper turns with the rail, <coughs> railroad cars. And uh, the railroad became known as the Plattsburgh and Dannemora and was completed in December 1878. In 1879, the Chattagay Railroad Company was incorporated on May 15, 1879 for the purpose of constructing a railroad from Dannemora to Lion Mountain. Previous to that, they had done surveys 
to uh, establish which way was the best way to go, either from Danamora to Lime Mountain or from Lime Mountain up to Chateaugay. And the route to Chateaugay seemed the more natural route for a railroad because it was more direct and more level. But there was a good friendship between the president of the Delaware and Hudson Company and the uh, president of the Chateaugay uh, Iron Company. Thomas Dixon was the president of the GNH, and Smith M. Weed was the president of the Chateaugay Iron Company. And Mr. Dixon convinced them that the best thing to do was to go through Danamora and down through Plattsburgh. And I'm sure that the reason for that was the DNH wanted the business. And the DNH had the foresight to see the passenger service that was going to come up for the Saranac Lake, Lake Placid area for tourism. On um, March 30th, 1880, the railroad from Danamora to Lime Mountain was open. Yeah. Some of this stuff to me got a little confusing in names of the companies and the leasing and the, and the interrelationship of all of the, the businesses. But uh, the railroad itself, which was originally narrow gauge, again, the three foot, they, when they expanded out to Pine Mountain, it was still three foot, uh, was extended to Standish, where a new blast furnace had been built in 1885. In 1886, it went on to Loon Lake. In 1887, it was extended to Saranac Lake, and that portion was financed through bonds that were purchased by the Delaware and Hudson Company. Who did the labor for constructing the lines? The best I could find, and this is, I just found it in one place, was that it was Italians and Negroes that did the railroad building. And that there was only one reference because that reference was to who did it here versus who did the Transcontinental Railroad where it was Irish and Chinese. And that was the only little sentence that I had found. That's where you found it with the well to build a railroad from Van Mark to Langone. Well, that's over here. Yeah. yeah. And then right through the wilderness. And with the machines that they added that day were horses. Alan, do you want some water? No, thank you. Kim? Sure. <laughs> That's why I didn't take any. In 1893, the railroad reached uh, Lake Placid, and the railroad from Saranac Lake to uh, Lake Placid was built as standard gauge, with the third rail to accommodate the existing equipment of the Shadow Day Railroad. Alan, can I ask a question? Yes. Whole railroad from 
Plattsburgh Concerned Athlete was rebuilt as standard gauge. And in 1903, the Delaware and Hudson Company leased the Chattagay and Lake Placid Railway Company for 500 years. It didn't work out well. And the railroad was operated as the Chattagay branch of the DNH. Union Depot in Saranac Lake was built by the Delaware and Hudson and provided service to trains of the New York Central as well as those of the DNH. It, uh, I also found one little word that said that at one time there was 18 to 20 trains a day that used the Union Station or Union Depot in Saranac Lake, which I found was staggering. One time I think there were three that went from here. What? Yeah. So the trains only get one three five day. That's not counting the hot jobs and all that. You know, it's quite a thing. It's a hot job. That's the one that's doing work. You know, like pulling cars and pulling the ore. It's a work, right? What would most of the passengers like? Tourists or people just using it to get back and forth? Yeah, it was a, it was, when they went to, like Al said, she, they class it in. And I think they were looking at the tourist trade. And there were mostly classes, mostly tourists on the train, on the train or, or local people. I remember people, you know, in standing saying, well, we went to Plattsburgh yesterday, went on the train. That was, that was the best way to go. Mm -hmm. you know, well, it was like like a road, and people didn't have cars. I'd say 374 maybe wasn't even paved at that time. No, 374 wasn't there at that time. I remember when they built 374. I remember the, the uh, material below Plattsburgh, below Dan Morris. Over here, Alex. Would the uh, TV patients uh, have come from, you know, on the train to certain places? I I didn't find any reference to that, but I'm going to guess that that was probably one of the ways to get there. Yeah. What did you say? The TV patients. Oh, I imagine that was the best way. To from New York City, you know, yeah. came from the city area. They, they could have come up on the New York Central, though, too. Because they, they had, a, they, yeah, I think right. they had a lot more service on the Central originally the, the trains. Originally, the d and the Central were separate tracks. Yeah. The last few years, the d used the Central track. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that leads into... In yeah, at least as far as they clear, they were one track. Yeah. In, in 1940, the Delaware and Hudson Railroad abandoned 22 miles of track from Plumador to Lake Clare Junction, and the service was maintained to Saranac Lake via trackage rights over the New York Central yeah. tracks. Yeah. And then in 1946, all rail service past Lime Mountain was abandoned. Where's Plumador? Plumador is in Middle Kills. In Wolf Pond, yeah. Middle Hill, Wolf Pond, Plumador. You probably will see it on some of your maps in here. The map, the map in the telegraphers in there has Plumador on it. I had to go in there and look myself because I couldn't find it online anywhere. Yeah. That's good. Or, or by looking at any of the map services. That's what I took Yeah. Central. Yeah. That line between Saranac Lake and Lake Plaza is still there. It's, it's still there. It's still there. At the Rondack Scenic Railway. Right. Yeah. They have to need to go there. Yeah. Lake Plaza and Lake and Taurus. I imagine a lot of people have never been on it. I think it's the Lake Plaza uh, building at the, at the end of the line that has a, a museum in it. I know it's one of them. The station. One, yeah, the station. Yeah, I remember the train that the... the uh, Station in Lake uh, Saranac Lake, like Al mentioned, was a combination station. It was agents from New York Central and there was agents from DNA. And at one time, their father was one of the agents for the DNA. I think uh, in your father's history, all his employment history is in the railroad room. The yeah, we yeah. In the first so picture. And after, you will find this picture on the wall. So this whole employment history yeah. for four years. Do you have a bottle of Genesee in his hand? Huh? Do you have a bottle of Genesee in his hand? No, I don't know. It's not an actual picture. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, actually it was Blue River. And I think if you look behind Ken, that satchel that is there may be the one that Mrs. Robinson would say they used to take the train because it was 
know, you know, the one that was part of Is that the one she used to take to Plattsburgh? There's one of them in here somewhere. I didn't get the whole question. No, I just pointed out when you mentioned the thing yeah. that you the said there's a bottle of blue ribbon in that side. No, there's not in there. But she used to take the train all the time and we have to catch Who did? George Robinson. Who? Um, George Robinson's wife. Victoria. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. George worked here in the state. Yeah, for many, many years. Oh, trade, you and the trade agent. Yeah. My, uh, first that I can even vaguely remember uh, exposure to the railroad was when my grandfather was the station, station agent in Los Sable Forks and uh, well, I was born in 1945 and he was the station agent down there from 46 to 54 and I can remember going down there and just sitting in the office and using the typewriter a little bit and fooling around. And, uh, at one point he got me, a little kid, a ride on the switcher engine that went from the US Sable station up to the J.J. Rogers uh, paper mill. And I can still remember, just the, the only thing I remember about the ride is getting to the mill and seeing some of the things that you can't, couldn't see about the mill, you know, if you had walked around whatever, and then uh, having the engine stop when it came down from the mill at, at Route 9, right at the uh, crossing in where the tracks crossed the route, route 9 where there was no signal. And uh, the train stopped there and let me off so I could walk home. Uh, the next, uh, well, I can remember, you know, being in the, the the freight portion of the, the station and uh, having people come in for packages that were were sent via the railway express agency and, and also uh, my grandfather taking some stuff to places to deliver it and uh, then uh, my next real connection with the Delaware and Hudson uh, even though I had started buying models and the HO model rail, rail, road trains and uh, either putting them together or just having them to, for, to look at. And I bought a whole bunch of stuff that somebody had done by hand, decorating the engines and stuff down in New York City when I was down there for, for business and found a little uh, model railroad shop that sold and stuff. But <clears throat> my next real ride, my uncle, Don, who worked for the DNH forever, uh, got me right out of the uh, uh, Colony Water Elite Yard down through to Albany, the Albany Yard on, on another switcher and the things I remember about that ride are that the engineer didn't know it was happening until I got on the train so he wasn't thrilled but he kind of warmed up to me with the way I was taking pictures and stuff but I can remember him sitting on the side looking out the engine like that and I'm on the other side looking the other way and he says here comes the grain train and it was the, the grain train that came from uh, western New York went into the port of Albany to load grain onto the, the ships for shipment overseas. Uh, again the, the stuff about my grandfather's work history is in the telegraphers from there but he uh, worked for the railroad for 42 years and one month uh, contrary to what it said in the Press Republican today, though, he never worked in my mountain. Who do you like? Somebody did. <laughs> but he did. He was the uh, station agent in uh, Spanish for 20 years, from uh, 1918 to 1938. Alan, one thing is, Tim's brother, Yes. He was the last station agent here, wasn't he? Yeah. In one mountain? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I didn't even know that. And his picture's in there yes. in the railroad room, too. Yeah. yeah, well, I got better pictures of him than that one. Yeah, well, well yeah, but he's... That's not, that's not, that's not a good picture. That's crazy. crazy. Yeah, I know. I can, yeah. He said, I'm gonna, somebody's going to take your picture. Like, when he got me that ride in, on the, in the, uh, from the Colony Water to the yard, we were waiting in the yard office for a while. 
and I have a picture of him smoking his pipe, just you know, looking very professional. But if you look at the picture, just above his picture, there's a poster that the railroad guys had up that says, "Help stamp out first marriage." <laughs> Help stamp out first marriage. And there was also a poster of a guy ice fishing and standing in the place where he was cut. So it was just one of their safety posters. My grandfather was Gold Blanky, and he started here in the railroad and ended up in uh, Plasma. Yeah. Dispatcher there. And then my, my great uncle was Frank Blanky. Oh, hey. And we dressed. Like two minutes? 
to buy luminous coal, which has a lot of impurities. That's soft coal. Is soft coal. Yes. Yeah. That they burn on the train. Yeah. And the, the anthracite is the real large coal. Yeah. And there's a lot of a lot of smoke from that soft coal. Yeah. That's why you see smoke on the train. Yes. The lady that wanted to know where Plumador was. There's a picture here which is very similar to the station that they had in Plumador, which was just a boxcar <clears throat> on the rail side where you feed on and off, put a flag up, and the train would stop so you could get on and get off the train. Also in Plumador, that's where they cut a lot of trees to make yeah. the uh, charcoal. And middle kills. Middle kills also there. Oh, well, you know, they had kilns on the other side of the engine. Yep, all the way up there. Aaron's kills, Storrs kills. Middle kills, all the way up there. Middle kills. And on that train, on that train, it went to, you know, the station where Twin Pond and the Twin Pond thing, and Mill Kill Station, and then Plumador, Wolf Pond, and then Plumador. And uh, uh, they had this, uh, there's a picture of the camp there, and uh, Mill Kills in the other room. Uh, it was a line house for the kilns. In fact, when we used to go up there, the kilns were right outside the door, remember, train? It was round things, and they had domes on, of course, I guess they're all destroyed now. Anyway, Frenchie and I and a couple other guys go up the camp there and we used to sometimes walk the track and uh, other times we'd go down and when the train was stopping at Standish, we'd get on the train and we'd tell them we want to get off the middle fields. Of course, they didn't normally stop there, but they'd stop and let us off. And they charged us 35 cents. And when we got to the camp, we'd come out, stand by the railroad, and just give us a signal that they'd stop and pick us up. And one time, they going into the stand, they say, they forgot to stop, you know, the conductor had to tell the engineer, and of course they didn't have phones and stuff like that, but then you got to take the phone. You better get a signal that they didn't stop. Well, anyway, they didn't stop, and I had to get off the stand. It was about three feet of snow. <laughs> and I jumped off, and my legs stopped, and my body wanted to keep going. <laughs> and I think I had like three or four frying pans and kettles and stuff on my back. <laughs> Lucky that I'm here. I'm not the greatest shape in here. <laughs> so you would do no say amen. Well, I was going to finish up with yeah. just one thing about the. You got one back there. You got one back here. Hey, Adam. You yeah. know what? Another thing that happened here is when Republic Steel when we're trying to get our iron and ore was working here. This is how they got their payroll to line up by train. Okay. Yeah. They they come down to the office up there with the horse and buggy. Yeah. Get up. And they stop right there at the uh, going up to the old school. Yep. Yeah. Well, so they got their mail too, friend. Yeah. I mean, they had mail places all the way along. You know, I, mean, I I think I'm not sure, but I think when somebody got hurt alive and the train was around, they take them by train too. Yeah. Oh, because in that right up for. Um, what do you think? Well, one of the late when somebody got driven the lines. You know, oh, yeah, yeah. One of the best in fact. Yeah. Yeah. Remember in Standish, where the post office used to be where Clay wife house yeah. is now. You know, that was a store. That's where the, the, the uh, narrow gauge went right by that store coming from Lime Mountain. It ran a, when it got to the big hill between here and Standish, it didn't go over the hill like the road does. It went around the hill. And then, uh, one branch went to 81 mines on the narrow gate. The other one went straight through to stand it. And this isn't the original station either. The other one was up on the hill. Oh, yeah. Through the narrow gate. Yeah. yeah. And then Sandy, of course, the post office was in that store that I'm telling you about, was for Clayfield as hell. And uh, Mr. Slotty was the postmaster at the time, as long as I can remember. And uh, you used to always have to send somebody either go he couldn't go himself and he had to take care of the store. So he, he had to send somebody down to, to get the mail off the train. And of course the train in the in the early years stopped and let the mail off. In the later years it had where you put your bag up and they hooked it and let it out the other bag off. But I can remember when Mr. Slattery's father uh, drove a horse and buggy down to the train to get the mail. That's all I remember about the last one. Okay, for Mr. Slaughter. Tim, his name was Tim Slaughter. Is it Tim Slaughter? Yeah, that's the lady that had to eat up their feet and stuff that they saw in my train, but they were kind. That was before my time. <laughs> 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 this, this is.
and tell yeah. this and now the beer garden. Yeah. The dirt got their beer it was by the drain. Oh yeah. Well, well I remember ice cream coming in on the drain. Well, I don't know about the ice cream, but ice cream. Insulated, insulated can, you know. It's but very possible because a lot of the same thing that might be feed that the IDA stole here in, in, in the hay and stuff. Yeah. Had to come there because they had a building. In fact, the building that yeah. was up there, we tore down the building right to Legion, but that's part of it. Yeah. Well, that was like, actually, that was the lifeline of the town. That's what it was. The lifeline of the town. That's where they got places, and got supplies, and so forth, and and got their products they were producing. Out. Very important part of the history of Lime Mountain, staying in the area. We could get the deacon to say a benediction. <laughs> Remember living in the sand there in the uh, I mean, station sand and uh, if you went in the if you came to the station there was a platform similar to this only it went pretty much around the and that, that first part was the freight freight house. We call it the freight house. Play basketball and so forth. It was called the freight house where you put the freight where the coal was and we used for a stove. And then we go down a few stairs and there's our living area. And you, if you go out through the kitchen, you come to the place like here where you eat it. So our, 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 everything was right there. Dad didn't have to go too far to go. Everyone has seen these milk bottles? No. Can we use the Yes. You know where it was? Yes. Just down the road here. We have. The gentleman who owned it was the vice president of Delaware Hudson. It was? Yep. Ted Guernsey killed that baby was real free. Yep. <laughs> this bottle has a lot of interest to me and many other people. If you travel on a railroad back in the 20s or 30s, whatever, <clears throat> eating breakfast, you needed milk and cream for your coffee. Yeah. As you know, quarter quart was not enough. You had enough for your cereal, but not enough cream for your coffee. So they introduced this bottle. Yeah. To my knowledge, there's only three dairies that ever used it. They were railroad dairies. Yeah. Some connection to the railroad. It was designed for a reason. There was enough milk for your cream for your cereal. Enough mm -hmm. cream for your mm -hmm. Yep. They also produced uh, ice cream, which they shipped out of here, and they sold in Chattagay and in Denver yeah. and other places. They also had Guernsey cows, which they shipped and showed all over the world. Milk and if you had a quarter of that Guernsey milk, almost halfway down, you could see the cream line. A quarter, of course, you just put cream in there. Yep. Yeah. I think Lindo that road was probably built. Wasn't that a private one? I think it was, yep. Sunset Inn? Sunset Inn. Yep, Sunset Inn Road was part of it. My father worked down there and he used to tell us they all wore the white suits and everything and they shipped the cattle to the state fair. Yeah. I mean, it was quite an operation. Oh, yeah, it was. Yeah. If you get off 374 down the Sunset Inn Road, when you come to the Y, just to the right of the Y, you'll find an old foundation of the barn. <clears throat> I mean, you can see what's left of what this area used to be back in the 20s and 30s. Well, uh, the late years when my uncle was the herdsman. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. They employed a lot of people from Chattagay Lake and from Chattagay who worked in the, uh, the barns there. And from you know that, that if anybody looked it up, that might be, well, of course, with the surrounding area too, might be California, that's the Probably. So they need their stuff for us. What was the name of the creamery? I'll let you pr pronounce it. Can't for you. <laughs> <laughs> and you? Yeah, Guernsey. Guernsey. No, Guernsey. 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 Oh, I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> I don't know. Guernsey. 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 But, you know, it's just to the right as they cross, we'll make the cross. The Longberg Road and the Yeah, the tracks on the railroad just to the right there, right behind where Badger's Hotel was. Right, and that foundation's still there. It is, yes. Yeah. And I remember people saying, you know, a lot of the late ladies around here, they used to work at the Badger Hotel, like girls working and stuff, you know. 
Everybody's still in the east. We'll see that girl and catch the train to go home. They slow down, I guess, in the crossing or something, they jump on. <laughs> <laughs> I remember Louis telling me that him and George, was, George was my also my brother and my father's brother, they both had girls, girls down there. And they took the horse and buggy down to see their girls. And the horse was so well trained that they get the start, the horse started up the road, they'd throw the reins up from the wagon, go to sleep, they'd bend up the horse and take them home to <laughs> Father-in-law's pictures up there too was the the uh, unless we took it down, she takes some of them down on the if they're related to me. He was a sex informer here for quite a few years. Raising the rates, and then they found another way. 
that was about the time when they started expanding, the, the railroads were expanding enough so that they, instead of using the, for them, instead of using the canal, they used uh, their own, own railroad, the Erie Railroad, that uh, went into New Jersey and then subsequently into New York. One of the uh, original investors in the DNH Canal wound up being the mayor of New York City. Home. His last name was Home. I'm not sure what his first name was. No, it's H O N E. He came from Britain. I wouldn't doubt it. Again, looking on the internet is a, is a good way to find a lot more information and a lot more detail on, on anything that I've it's attempted to cover today. It's amazing to look at those yards. Oh, yeah. The real yeah. old yards, it's just amazing yeah. to think that they went to Bradley Farm and they yeah. all kinds of, all kind of branches they had in there. What was Bradley Pond used for? Huh? What was Bradley Pond Spur used for? I think it was charcoal. Yeah, it? making charcoal. Yeah. 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 Oh, just a spur that came off. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that probably was narrow heat. I would have Yeah, when yeah. the first one in, yeah, at least. But it does show on both maps, both the standard and the narrow gauge. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, some people have pictures of the railroad with its three rails, you know. And that's when they were switching over. They could also run a standard gauge on the railroad, or they could run a narrow gauge. Because they had the had the short gauge in there, and they could run either one. But um, they're, one of their main things when they switched over, I'll you tell them about that about why they why they had to straighten out some of them. Because of the turn rating system. Yeah. Because the, the standard gauge trains could not turn as quickly as some the narrow. Some of the turns they had to straighten out. Yeah. Bit. And the, 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 there was still a. The railroad needs basically something that is flatter in order to run well. But there are places where the, the grade was five percent, you know, it was a five percent grade coming from Plattsburgh to Danamar. Uh, I, I, I don't know if I said this in here, it was the other room I mentioned today, but I never saw it myself, but people that I've talked with, and uh, I could have seen it because it was at my time, but they say when the train went from here, were spent here loaded with, with cinder, cinders when they were taking it to Troy to be in the blast furnace, or when they take taken big iron from Sandy. They had a, a real heavy load, and like Al was talking about the grade, and they tell me that it was almost like the 4th of July at night to watch that train go down from the hill to Danamore because they had to kind of block their brakes and the sparks would fly like crazy. Mm -hmm. And of course, in the summertime, that's a danger of fire. They did go to the and one of their a number of reasons for uh, expanding and taking into the standard gauge from all the way from Plattsburgh all the way up to Saranac Lake was the uh, you didn't have to transfer passengers from one train to another in Plattsburgh. And the other thing was uh, originally when they shipped stuff out of Vine Mountain down to Plattsburgh, they had a platform in Plattsburgh where they could take the narrow gauge cars out and transfer the loads onto the standard gauge yeah. rail to, to go out, which is got to be a lot of work to get. That's going to be stuff. There's a lot of little things that... Yeah, really interesting. There's a lot of little things that... I would say, if I, would, if I was to have to estimate, I would say about 90% you were telling the truth today, huh? <laughs> With, with some of the research I've done, I don't know if it's, if, if it's really that high because there's, yeah. you, know, you, you read one yeah. article here and well, if you, you're you telling believe 90, that and then find another one that, you know. Yeah, I know. But if you were telling 90, that's better than you. Yes. <laughs>
you have any other questions while you're roaming through? I'm sure they'll be here for a while, so right, don't hesitate to ask them. Well, there you have it, a June 1st, 2013 Talk Here Museum weekend in and around Clinton County. We've been at the Lion Mountain Mining and Railroad Museum, and I know I certainly learned uh, a few details about the railroading history in the North Country that I should have been aware of and didn't, didn't know about. We invite you to check out our Hometown Cable Network website. We have more videos to put up there eventually from years past, but uh, uh, the Adirondack Scenic Railroad trip, we rode on the engine uh, and that from uh, Lake Placid to Saranac Lake. So if you want to see what it looks like to, to ride that rail and get a, a cattle catcher's view of it, uh, you can watch that. We've done many shows up here in, in and around Lion Mountain. We've talked a lot of history with the miners, uh, athletes, and uh, authors such as Larry Gooley who's written many books. He's here today signing books for, for folks. He and, he and Jill are here signing books from below to toe. And uh, we invite you to uh, Take a trip around and uh, enjoy our our North Country museums. They have a lot to offer, and it's all down-to-earth history that uh, that you'll find interesting. You don't have to be a, a college degree or a master's degree to uh, want to know about your hometown and the history. And uh, you'll find a lot if you come visit these things, and they're explained to you by people who are are down home just like uh, you might be. So, how to wrap it up from beautiful downtown Lion Mountain, June 1st, 2013. We plan to be back here to learn more about their sports exhibit this in this summer of 2013. Thanks for watching.